Australia. Isolated by geography, outlandish by nature. He's huge. He's muscular. He's veiny. Very brutal, very fast. Deadly mates. Sexual cannibalism. Bizarre love triangles. Blimey, that's a big old claw. Australia's animals push the boundaries of what it means to fight. You don't want to mess with me, mate. And what it takes to win. Because I'll rip your face off. This is go time. Every day, everywhere, our planet is a battleground. <coughs> Turf wars, food fights, and mating mayhem rage on as animals outwit and outmaneuver their own kind in Battle of the Alphas. Kangaroos, they're cute, they're quirky, and they're born to box. Young males learn these boxing skills from their mothers. And so their moms take the time to teach them how to fight a little bit. Someday you'll need to know these skills. And so they're grappling with their son, and the, the son learns how to do these moves. They'll start doing their mock boxing. This type of social behavior ultimately will train these young males to potentially be the alpha, the one that gets to spread his genetic material to any female he wants in that mob. Like boxers climbing the ranks, each year of practice builds technique and more muscle. The bouts last longer and hurt more. All this training, all this pain, is directed toward one goal, control of the mob. We know that lions live in prides and whales live in pods. A multitude of kangaroos is referred to as a mob. A mob is composed of several adult females and juveniles of both sexes. A mob can have as few as eight individuals and as many as 100. And just by looking at a mob of kangaroos, sometimes it's easy to pick out who's going to be on top. When they become alpha males, they get these great big huge shoulders. It looks like you photoshopped a really ripped guy's upper body on a kangaroo's body. He looks like a prize fighter. He is the roux at the top. No one messes with him. And they all want what he has. The females. Small wonder this roux has pull. He is quite the specimen. Two meters of pure muscle. He can outrun a racehorse. 64 kilometers an hour. Two car lengths in a single hop. He's huge. He's muscular. He's veiny. He's ready to kill anyone that is going to interrupt his intentions with the ladies. And every once in a while, the younger male, who thinks it's now their time, steps up and takes on the alpha. They raise themselves up as tall as they can. They might pull out some grass, touch their sternum, might squirt a little urine, just letting the other male know that this is go time. It's a musky showdown. One male waiting for the other to blink. The challenger is a scrappy punk. He's got good footwork and a solid left jab. But this is his first bout with a real alpha. There are really two big weapons that you have to watch for. One is the claws. Those claws are made for digging, and they work very well in the dirt, but they'll work even better on your eyeballs. And so what you see in these fights is males being very careful, really arching their heads away from the other male to protect themselves against those claws that could do a lot of damage. The kangaroo's tail is its Swiss army knife. When it's moving slowly, kangaroos switch to a different form of locomotion that you don't see in any other kind of mammal, and it's called pentapedal locomotion. In other words, it's five-footed locomotion. That tail actually pushes as hard as the front legs and hind legs combined, because there's so much muscle in there. 
But once in combat, the tail becomes a different kind of tool. It's the fulcrum for a kick of deadly ferocity. They're kicking with about 850 pounds per square inch of pressure. Ultimately, how hard you can kick depends on the transmitting of force. So as hard as your feet are pushing against their body, your tail also has to push back against the ground. Now, added to that large foot is a very long, sharp claw. They have a muscular girdle around them that helps protect against some of these kicks. So these kangaroos are built not only to deliver the punches and kicks, but also to receive them. Take that. And that. The challenger is holding his own. Until the alpha delivers the punchline. A devastating kick to the belly. The challenger has had all he can stomach. One more kick might rupture something. This tough guy got off lightly. Just a slightly puffy eye. Meanwhile, on the sidelines, the wannabes were watching and making mental notes. There will be a day that one of these challengers will defeat him, just like a boxer. And whoever wins that match is the new alpha. They're not banished from society. They're still there. It's just they're not going to have as much sex. This alpha keeps his spot at the top of the mob. But he better watch his back, because the young tops are sparring, preparing for their chance to show him who's mob boss. Four thousand kilometers away, in Australia's Northern Territory, under every log, a world of life and death. This is the peacock jumping spider. She's small, about the size of a pencil eraser, but she is fast and deadly. They've actually been observed to bring down creatures that are four times their size. But one of her favorite foods is just a little smaller than her. The male peacock jumping spider. Her immobilized victim is still alive as she devours him. He paid the ultimate price because he was a bad dancer. A female jumping spider's idea of a good date is dinner and a show. The male is the show. And if his performance doesn't measure up, he's also dinner. So he must dance as though his life depends on it. Because it does. The peacock spider is alone on the dance floor, and he is trying to save his life by doing the dance in a way that will impress the female so she doesn't kill him. It does this conspicuous dance of light, color, and sound. Their weaponry is essentially their ability to create a beautiful dance with the ultimate prize of not being killed <laughs> and getting a chance to mate. If a female is not pleased with the dance that a male is doing, or frankly, any other aspect of his behavior or posturing, she may decide to swoop in and kill him. And the verdict is dinner. His consolation prize is an injection of venom. There's a whole lot of reasons why a female could potentially attack a male, and they may have nothing to do with his sperm, even though that is the thing that he is endlessly trying to advertise. <laughs> She may actually need calories. Sexual cannibalism certainly gives new meaning to a dinner date, especially if you're a spider. And when we're talking about sex, life and death is very, very closely related to that. A lot of animals can lose their life as they are simply trying to mate. Another contestant steps forward. He doesn't want to suffer the same fate as his rivals. 
The mating ritual of the peacock spiders is very complicated. It'll begin with a pheromonal cue. A male will pick up uh, from silk fibers that a female has exuded from her abdomen. As he touches the silk, chemoreceptors in his legs and palps detect her presence. Once a male has detected that there is a viable female in his vicinity, he will begin doing a vibrational kind of dance. It almost looks as though he's using his little pedipalp appendages to play a bongo drum. And this very low vibrational sound will attract the female, potentially get her attention. So they don't hear in the way that we hear, but a female can sense those vibrations through the legs and their sensory organs. One pair of the spider's eight eyes are telephoto lenses. The female zooms in on the male. She waves a reply. You have my attention. But what is her intention? What's going on behind those eight eyes? She wants his body, but only she knows what for. He narrowly escapes, but the urge to mate is powerful. He must take the risk and try again. And then the male starts going into a much more complicated dance, the whole time being quite aware of her body positioning and exactly how she is receiving the signals that he's sending. Because if she is into the action, he's going to behave quite a bit differently than if she's not. They have these amazing abdomens that are brightly colored with pigments and with iridescent scales that make them really flashy. And they can extend their abdomens up like the tail of a peacock. There are times where it can go very quickly, but other times where a male has got to utilize a lot of stamina and keep that dance going for as long as it takes to grab a female's attention. It can be exhausting, up to 45 minutes at a time. It's a virtuoso performance, but can he be certain? If a female decides that a certain male's dance is up to snuff and she does want to mate with him, a male will take his sperms and use a petty pout, one of those appendages that he was using to play the bongo drums earlier, and he will transfer the sperm directly into the genital opening of the female. It's a fairly unromantic scenario, the actual sex part. Really, for these spiders, it's all about the buildup and less about the sperm transfer. Luckily for him, she likes the beat. He successfully mates with her. This peacock jumping spider lives to dance another day. Australia's northeast coast. Beneath the waves, there are winners, there are losers. And then there is a creature that can win a battle by pretending to lose. The amazing, ever-changing cuttlefish. You're looking at an animal that couldn't be more alien. They have, what, three hearts? They have these arms that work under their own pseudo-brains. They have a beak like a parrot that potentially is one of the strongest bite forces on the planet. Like its cephalopod cousins, the octopus and the squid, the cuttlefish is designed to fight. Eight arms for grappling, an ink sac for a smoke screen, and jet propulsion to eject from danger. But the cuttlefish's great strength is in psychological warfare. Its skin is stealthy technology. They can change color in nanoseconds. It's all thanks to a microscopic biological curiosity called the chromatophore. The color change ability comes from these fantastic cells called chromatophores. Got all these tiny cells which are rigged up with strands of muscle to open them and expand these bags of pigment, these bags of color. And that can happen as fast as you can blink. Researchers placed a cuttlefish in an enclosure over a neutral background and then quickly switched to a background not found in nature. And the cuttlefish changed with it. 
they can change color to hide themselves from their prey, but also hide themselves from their predators. They can hide against sand or they can hide against coral. But the cuttlefish skin is for more than just hiding. The real beauty of the color change comes when they're trying to communicate to other members of their own species. Especially when two males are attracted to the same female, or three males, or four. The message, back off. Ratio of males to females can be like 10 to one. See, they're getting pestered like crazy, and they reject about 70% of them outright. Those are tough odds. Any male who has skin in this game better be prepared to lose it. First stage, sometimes something as quick as a lunge or just a brief flash of color, that kind of shock factor is enough to dissuade the other male, especially if they're smaller. The way for the cuttlefish to say, look at me, look how strong, how fit and how healthy I am, that I can run this kaleidoscope on my body. You don't want to mess with me, mate, because I'll rip your face off. If it reaches the point where these guys do come to blows, it's very brutal, very fast. The suckers on the arms and the tentacles are ripping, they're biting, they're tearing. And if the dominant animal can get close enough with that razor-sharp beak, it will take a serious bite. When they lock heads, they're trying to kill each other. It looks like a bloodbath, but it's an ink bath. Once a cuttlefish starts squirting ink, that really is saying, whoa, 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 mate, game over, game over, I want to get gone. Finally, the rival ejects himself from the battle. Another mating opportunity will require new tactics. Meanwhile, the alpha's armor has turned amorous. His charm offensive begins. He flashes, he flatters. So when mating does occur, the animals go head to head, and the male will use a specialized arm to pull from inside his mantle chamber what we call a spermatophore, which is kind of like a Christmas cracker of sperm. And then he will place it in a special receptor site within the mouth area of the female. The dominant male has accomplished his genetic mission. He has ensured his genes will perpetuate. At least that's what he thinks. This battle is far from over. Now, most of the time, it's the big alpha who wins, and they get to be the dad. But with the cuttlefish, being the loser doesn't necessarily mean that you miss out. In fact, being the brainiest can give you just as good a chance at getting a mate. There is a genius trick that some males use called sexual mimicry. They actually change all their body colors and even their body posture to look just like a receptive female. A male hides his special arm that makes him look like a male, changes his coloration to act kind of female, and then also holds his arms in the way that a female holds them when she's about to lay an egg. And then he just swims right by the big dangerous male. What he doesn't realize is he's letting in a bit of an undercover Romeo. It's called a sneaker male. It's a genius strategy, and it's successful. He fathers some of the offspring without the big male even knowing that he got by him. Then the small trickster doubles down. He commits a second act of sexual subterfuge. The male might try and use his siphon to blast water into this sperm receptive area to try and get rid of other male sperm, thus ensuring that he is the one that fathers the most eggs. As the female deposits her eggs, the larger male stands guard, none the wiser. In the world of the cuttlefish, cunning is the mark of a true alpha. And the next generation is likely to inherit its paternal talent for disguise. From the sea to the shores of Queensland, low tide, the sands are a massive sieve, straining water and leaving behind bits of decayed vegetation breakfast for the warriors.
When you see a fiddler crab, you have a very instant reaction. You think, blimey, that's a big old claw. It's absolutely enormous. The claw can be a third to a half of the size of the fiddler crab. Sometimes it's on the left, sometimes on the right. Why does it need such a large claw? Well, the answer is in both survival and reproduction. You get huge, huge aggregations of these animals on the beaches where they are found. And they need to differentiate themselves from others to try and attract a female to their burrow. What better way to wave the females in than with a really, really big sign? <laughs> so it's sort of like going shopping in a way. A female will be walking along and she will see all of the different signaling males. Constantly waving this big claw is a great way to signal across the whole beach. Showing her their nests, their entryways into their gates of heaven. So it's kind of like pushing burgers into your mouth with one hand and say, oh, darling, with the other. When a female gets close to a few competing males, the males start to duke it out for her attention. And this beach is packed with one-armed jacks looking for a queen. When two males actually get into a physical fight over a female, it can get really violent because the males would be use these large advertising claws as formidable weapons. It's strong enough to give your finger a nasty welt and it can snap off a rival claw. You've got these huge, enormous garden shears stuck on there. It's crazy. One gardener takes his shears and flees. Finally, a chance to eat. But on this crowded stretch of beachfront, there's plenty of bullies trying to grab your burrow. It can get violent very, very quickly. Males can grab onto each other, rip appendages off. If they've spent their whole lives investing all this energy into building this huge claw and then it's suddenly lost, that's a big hit. So what happens then is the small claw will now become the new big claw, the same size or even bigger as the original claw, with one incredible drawback. <laughs> it's entirely useless as a fighting weapon. The regenerated claws actually lack mass and lack a lot of muscle. But it's not all bad. A big original fiddle has its disadvantages. Waving around half your body weight takes a lot of energy. And more energy requires more feeding. The new replacement claw weighs only half as much as the original. So a male sporting a fake only has to feed half as much, which leaves him more time for waving and mating. It's a fantastic example of deceptive signaling. A big claw, you can still wave it around. In fact, you could say it's easier to wave because it's now lighter, so the females are still going to see it. So they can be a bit of a smoke screen. The crabs cannot tell by simply looking at a claw whether it is an old claw or a regenerated claw. And actually, if you're really, really aggressive with a really big claw, you're able to scare away males that might have a stronger but slightly smaller claw because you're just all up in their grill. Better still, female fiddler crabs can't tell the difference either. They are equally attracted to a large regenerated claw as they are to an original. None of these beachcombers knows who's for real and who's bluffing. And there's lots of bluffing. Because of all of this violent behavior, many males, up to 50% of the population, will have lost their big claw at some point. Call it the riddle of the crabby fiddle. In this battle of the alphas, no one knows who's packing real heat and who's firing blanks. From the bush country of New South Wales to the brain fight on the OK Coral. When it comes to extremes, trust Australia to deliver. <laughs>